Hi, my name is Bahadur Ahmedov. This is the first video lecture from the series of the lectures about the centrifugation. A centrifuge is a machine which helps us to separate the particles depending on their mass, density, and the shape. And the, what, the, what basically defines the centrifuge or the centrifugation is the, the two theories. So one is the movement of a particle around the circle, and the second is the sedimentation theory. So today, in this video lecture, we are going to discuss about the movement of the particle on the circle, and we're going to try to figure out what kind of forces are applied to the particle, and what, are, what, what other physical quantities should be calculated when the particle is moved around the circle. But first of all, let me just explain you the idea of the centrifugation or the sedimentation. So it basically tells you that, hey, if you've got just a tube with the fluid inside and you are going to just put some particles into this tube, some of the particles are going to sink to the top, uh, to the bottom of this tube if the density is much more higher than the density of the fluid. And some of the particles are going to float to the top of the tube if the density is much smaller than the density of the fluid. If the density of the particle is the same as the density of the fluid, then they're going to just uh, stay steady. So you see, so the force which basically pulls these particles down to the bottom of the tube is the gravitational force, which is equal to the mass of the particle times the g which is like a, the gravitational acceleration. And the g is the constant, which is equal to the 9.8 meters per second in the square. So in our theory of the centrifugation, this g is really important. So please just uh, try to remember this number. So you can just remember that the gravitational acceleration is roughly equivalent to the 10 meters per second in the square. So now you see, so this force, the gravitational force, is not so strong with respect to these tiny particles. And it's not so sensitive to the tiny differences of the, in terms of the density of the two different particles. So what we want is we would like to substitute this gravitational force with another force, which is going to be much more stronger. So now let's discuss what kind of force we can substitute the gravitational force with. So now what we want is we would like to just plug in this tube into some rotor and we are going to just rotate this tube around the axis of the rotation. And as we are going to rotate this, we can just give the velocity of the rotation. Okay, so how, how fast we are going to rotate this tube. And this velocity here is going to be calculated using this formula. And the meaning of this velocity is how many meters this tube is passing per one second. And it can be calculated by multiplying the omega to the r, where the omega is going to be the angular velocity. And the angular velocity is basically the same as the velocity, but now it basically measures the distance in terms of the different units. While the linear velocity measures the distance in terms of the meters, the angular velocity is going to measure the distance in terms of the radians. So the angular velocity is the amount of the radians passed by the tube in one second. We can calculate the angular velocity by just multiplying the two pi to the f, where the f is going to be the frequency. So essentially, hey, how many times this tube is rotated around the axis? So if, for example, your rotor is going to rotate this tube five times per second, then the f, the frequency, is going to be simply equal to the 5 hertz. So you can just plug this to here and calculate the angular velocity. If you know how many times your tube is rotated, you can know what is the angular velocity. And by just multiplying the angular velocity to the radius of a circle, you can calculate the linear velocity. So now it appears that as we are going to just move this particle around a circle, there is so-called centripetal force, which is try to puts this particle towards the center of the circle. And the centripetal force can be calculated by just multiplying the mass of a particle to the radial acceleration. And the radial acceleration is going to be calculated using this formula. So either we're going to just square the velocity and divide this as a radius, either we're going to just square the angular velocity and multiply this to the r. 
So please note that these two formulas are very much interchangeable, right? So we can easily calculate the angular velocity from the linear and vice versa by just multiplying or dividing to the radius. So it appears at the same time, there is another force apparently appears, which is going to be called like a parent centrifugal force, which is the force which the particle feels when it goes to move around the circle of motion. And this apparent centrifugal force is the force which puts which pulls these particles down to the bottom of the tube outward from the circle. So this is the force which we are going to just create to in order to separate the particles. And this force is going to be equivalent to the centripetal force. And we're going to calculate this in the same way as the centripetal force, by just multiplying the mass of a particle to the radial acceleration. So let's do the couple of calculations of the radial acceleration to try to understand what is this and how it is comparable with the gravitational acceleration. So let's say I've got a vacuum cleaner. This rotor is going to be rotated 600 times per minute. I would like to calculate the radial acceleration if the radius is equal, the radius of the rotor is equal to the nine centimeters. So essentially the diameter in this case is going to be equal to the 18 centimeters. So I can calculate the radial acceleration by just multiplying the omega in a square times the radius, right? And at the same time, omega can be calculated by just multiplying the 2 pi to the frequency. And if you remember, the frequency is the number of the rotations of the tube in one second. So now, essentially, if you know that the vacuum cleaner, the rotor, is rotated 600 times, so 600 revolutions per minute, so in order to just know how many times it's going to be rotated per second, you can just divide this to the 60. So mathematically, or theoretically, it looks like this. So you're going to just multiply the revolutions per minute to the one minute, divide it to the 60 seconds. Then you can just divide all of these terms. It's going to be C equal to the one divided to the uh, 10 times to the one divided to the second, which is like a 10 hertz. You can just plug this to here. It's going to be 20 pi because the f now is a 20 uh, 10 hertz right and if you just plug this to here it's going to be a 400 times as a pi in a square times as a radius and if you just do the calculations by just plugging here the radius which is 0 0.09 meters and the pi is equal to the 3.14 it's going to be roughly equal to the 350 meters per second in the square so what is interesting is that the gravitational acceleration g is roughly 10 meters per second in the square. And if you compare this acceleration with this one, it's going to be 75 times greater than the G. So please note that V on Earth, all of us are feeling this gravitational force. So if you're staying on the Earth, you can feel the gravitational force which puts you down to the Earth, which is going to be equivalent to the mass times to the G. So we feel actually the force, which is equivalent to the 1g, okay? And the items which are going to be rotated in this, in this, uh, in the rotor of the vacuum cleaner are going to feel the 35 times greater. So please note that the gravitational force of the sun is about 30g, okay? And the, and the force which can be created in a small vacuum cleaner is equivalent to the 35g. So now let's do another problem. So let's say, uh, so people at the NASA, what they did is they wanted to uh, train the astronauts when they go to the space where they are going to feel the much more stronger gravitational fields. So essentially, for example, the astronaut which is going to go to the space should, should, should feel the 3G, so three times to the uh, gravitational field of the Earth, for example, and they should be trained and one of the ways to train them is to, uh, is to put them to the human centrifuge and try to see that, hey, so they are going to feel this, this amount of the force. So I would like to just show you, that you, can just, you can see how big this human centrifuge is by just scaling this with this person who's standing here. So what we want is we would like to just place the astronaut to here, and we are going to rotate this human centrifuge with a certain velocity. 
As we are going to rotate this faster and faster, this person is going to feel the centrifugal force, which is going to pull this down much more stronger and stronger. So now the question is, how fast we need to rotate the centrifuge? So this person who is sitting there is going to feel the centrifugal force, which is equivalent to the 3 times the g. So we're going to calculate this problem in a very much similar way as we did before. So if you remember, we previously calculated the radial acceleration, and it was equal to the 350, and we, wrote, we could write this down in terms of the g as a 35 times the g, right? So we are going to do the pretty much the same here. So we're going to calculate the radial acceleration, right? And it can be calculated, or essentially its magnitude can, can be calculated by just multiplying the uh, by just dividing the velocity of the centrifuge and the square divided to the radius. So this should be, so this is the radial acceleration and this should be equal to the 3 times the g. So 3 times the gravitational acceleration. So from here we can find a v in the square which is equal to the 3g which is 9.8 which is roughly 10, right? Times the radius which is 9 meters Okay, so the g is meters per second in the square. And if you find a v from here, it's going to be roughly square root of 270 because 3 times the 9 is 27 times the 10, 270 times the meters per second. So as we are going to rotate the centrifuge at this velocity, the person who sits in the, at the end of the, of the centrifuge is going to feel the centrifugal force, which is equivalent to the 3 times the gravitational force. So you see, so it's common to measure the centrifugal force in terms of the g. Okay, and there is a reason why we're going to do this. We're going to come back to this in a moment. So let's 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 try to solve another problem, which is like a more realistic in terms of the centrifuges. So we're going to define the centrifugal field now, which is going to be the same as the angular, um, the radial acceleration, which is like a, just simply the omega in a square times the r or it can be calculated as a v squared divided to the r, and these two formulas are very much interchangeable. So now let's say I've got a centrifuge which is going to be rotated 60,000 times per minute, and the radius of the centrifuge is equal to the 7 centimeters. So I would like to calculate the radial acceleration for this. So we can just calculate this uh, using this formula, but before we do this, we can calculate the frequency. So if the centrifuge rotates the tube 60,000 times per minute, then it's going to rotate this tube 1,000 times per second. And it's very much easy to get a frequency from the RPM units by just dividing this to the 60. So now we just need to plug this into the formula of the velocity, which is like a t pi rf. If you don't remember this formula, you can just always multiply the omega to the r in order to find a v, and the omega is going to be 2 pi f, okay? So if you just put all of these numbers and calculate this, we're going to get this centrifugal field, or the radial acceleration, which is going to be 2 million 700 thousands, right? So it's a huge number. It's going to be, uh, in terms of the magnitudes of the g, it's going to be 270,000 times greater than the g. So you see, see how strong the, the centrifugal field might be for the particles, and it's going to be very much sensitive to the tiny di density differences between the two different uh, particles. So now what we want is we would like to just introduce another unit, which is going to be called as the RCF. So let's say you've got uh, the, uh, the um, centrifuge with a certain type of rotor, Okay, and, and if you would like to calculate, hey, so how, how much the centrifugal force, the particle sits there, is going to feel. We can calculate this by just calculating the radial acceleration, which is equivalent to the omega in the square times the radius, right? So essentially, the omega is, uh, is, is proportional to the number of the revolutions per, uh, per minute. Okay, as you're going to uh, uh, rotate the tube faster, then the, uh, then the force, the centrifugal force is going to be higher, right? But now, th let's say you've got two different centrifuges, so in, one, in two different labs. So in one lab, you've got a centrifuge with a 10 centimeters radius, and in the second one, you've got it with a 20 centimeter radius.
So even though you're going to rotate both of the centrifuges at the same rate, so let's say 10,000 times per minute, the particles and the two different centrifuges are going to feel the centrifugal force differently. So what we want is we would like to the settings of these two centrifuges be not in the revolutions per minute, so they should be in terms of the centrifugal force. So we are going to just call this as a relative centrifugal force, and we are going to measure the centrifugal force in terms of the multiples of the g. As we did before, so if you remember, so for the vacuum cleaner, we calculated that the, the, uh, the radial acceleration is going to be 35 times the g. So in order to calculate the RCF, we're going to just use this relationship. We're going to just divide the force on the radial direction, which is like a mass times to the radial acceleration, right? Divided to the gravitational force, mg. So you can just cancel this m and this m. You can just calculate the rest of the terms. So I just would like to explain you what is our goal. So, for, for, so what is our objective for the RCF? So what I want is I would like to figure out the function which is going to be dependent on the RPM. So essentially, if I've got a machine, and if I'm going to rotate this machine at the 10,000 times per minute rate, then what is going to be the centrifugal force created on this machine? right? So if I input the 10,000 times, what is going to be RCF? I would like to get this function. So that's why here on this omega, so I'm going to just separate the RPM from the omega. So I'm going to explain you what do I mean at this stage. So the omega was, if you remember, it was t pi times to the frequency and the square times to the radius divided to the g, right? So this is still the RCF. So at the same time, the frequency is, can be calculated by just dividing the RPM to the 60, right? RPM is the number of the revolutions per minute. Divided to the 60 gives you the frequency. So I'm going to uh, substitute this RPM divided to the 60 in the square times to the radius divided to the G, okay? Then I'm going to use, uh, like a, rearrange the terms. I'm going to write this as a 4 pi in the square divided to the 3,600 times to the g, times to the rpm in the square, times to the radius r. And if you just calculate this term by just plugging the value of the p to be equal to the 3.14, by plugging the value of the g as a 9.8, you will get a value here, it's gonna be equal to the 1.12 times to the 10 to the power of minus three, RPM in the square times to the R, okay? So I've got here the formula which is going to relate the RCF with the RPM using this equation. So for a given RPM, we can be, uh, we're able to calculate the RCF. So let me explain you how we calculate this technically. So let's say I've got a certain type of the rotor. So essentially, we might differentiate the centrifuges depending on the type of the rotors as well. So some of the rotors are going to rotate the tubes vertically, and some of them are going to rotate the tube at a fixed angle. So the thing is, for this kind of your rotors, the particles which are sitting here are going to feel the different centrifugal force than the particles which are on the bottom of the tube. What we want is we would like to calculate the RCF, the relative centrifugal force for the particles which are on the top of the tube and on the bottom of the tube. So what we're given is we're going to rotate this rotor 20,000 times the RPM revolutions per minute. The radius on the top is 3.5 centimeters. The radius on the bottom is 7 centimeters. And for this given values, we need to calculate the RCF. So let's do the calculations. So the RCF, RCF can be calculated by multiplying 1.12 times to the 10 in the power of minus 3 times to Z, the, the RPM. So now we're given this 20,000 times, right? And the square times to the radius, which is 3.5 times to the 10 in the power of minus 2 meters, right? We need to convert the centimeters into the meters. So now, if you just like a do the calculations by multiplying all of these numbers, you're going to get 
So 1.12 times 2. So 10 in the power of minus 3. So 20,000 times, uh, 2 is the 20,000 times. It's going to be equal to the 2 times the 2 is 4. There's four zeros, and the square is going to be 8 zeros. So it's going to be 10 in the power of uh, 8 times is 3.5 times is in 10 in the power of minus 2 meters. And if you calculate all of the things, you're going to get 15,680. Okay, so this is the RCF on the top of the tube. And we're going to, the units of the RCF is going to be G. So essentially, we're going to say that, hey, the particle on this centrifuge on the top of the tube is going to feel the centrifugal force, which is going to be greater than the gravitational force, 15,000 times. So this is what does it mean, the RCF. So now, essentially, whenever you're going to deal with the centrifuges, you need to know also what is the RCF, so what kind of centrifugal force it is being able to produce. So at the same time, if you would just calculate the RCF in the bottom of this tube, the RCF in the bottom. So just instead of the 3.5, you would just put the 7. And if you would just calculate, it, it's going to be simply twice more than the on the top of the of the of the tube. It's going to be equal to the 31,360 G. So essentially on the bottom of the tube, the particles are going to feel the centrifugal force in terms of the 31,000 times of the gravitational force. So essentially, you see, so for us, it was really important to get a formula which is going to relate the RPM with the RCF. So it's important to understand what is the relationship between them. So essentially, we've got this equation, which is like a RCF is equal to 1.12 times the radius, right? Times to the RPM in the square times to the 1.12 times to the 10 in the part of minus 3 times to the radius, right? So you see, so the, they are connected quadratically, okay? So the relationship between the RCF and RPM is quadratic, which essentially means that, hey, if you've got a centrifuge, you're going to start rotating this at the rate of 10,000 times, and if you decide to increase the rate from 10,000 to the 20,000, essentially twice, then the RCF, the relative centrifugal force, is going to be increased four times. So this is what does it mean, this equation. And again, all of the series about the motion of a particle on a circle. So in our next series of the videos, we're going to discuss that, hey, what kind of forces are going to be interacted when we're going to put the particle into the tube with some fluid, and we're going to rotate this.